There we go. Now we're recording. Okay, so welcome to the first of a series of workshops on teaching writing to the international student. Um, so this is workshop one on understanding the scores that are used to um, accept and place students and to think about those scores in terms of what students can do in terms of writing. Um, we also will have part two on writing prompts and part three on giving good feedback in March and April, and those are posted to the FCI calendar at innovatepark.org, if you wanna follow that. And there are locations and Zoom links for those for the next two workshops. Um, first, let me introduce myself in case you don't know me. I'm Amy Mecklenburg-Fanger, and I'm the director of Park Rights, which is our writing across the curriculum program, that I'm happy to say is finishing its second year of official existence. Park, which is very exciting. <laughs> Um, I am joined today uh, by Amy Jenkins, one of our, I'm going to bring her in camera range, who's the director of ELCI, which is the English Language and Culture Institute, yeah, got it, and Zephyr Weber, who's on her way over to the camera, who is um, an ESL tutor in the Academic Support Center. So I brought them in today as experts on um, how international student writing is sort of scored and what those scores mean. So I'm gonna hand it over to them in just a second. Um, before we do that, I just wanna show you one other thing. Um, Park Brights does announce a lot of its events, of course, online, and when we partner with FCI, which we are partnered with today, and we're very grateful for their assistance, um, we also will post notices on our Park Brights um, Facebook page and I'm gonna pull this up so you can see it. Forgot to share the screen. Did it go? Close where it's a little Facebook mark. Oh no. There we go. This got it. Okay. So hopefully you can see our computer screen right now. And what I'm showing you is the Facebook page for the Park Rights group. This is an open group, so anyone can join it. However, you should be aware that this does not expose your private Facebook page to the public, right? So you can join this and still sort of keep privacy settings on your personal um, Facebook account. Um, to join it, you can actually just search for the Park Rights page in Facebook, um, and you'll come to this page and you can click join, and it sends me a little link and I just approve people who request it. Um, or you can contact me directly by email at amy.mecklenburgfanger at park.edu. Um, and you can join us. Uh, we post, you can see announcements of our events, but we also post conversations about writing across the disciplines, events that are happening outside of Park University, and resources for teaching writing across the curriculum. I also post pictures of our very beautiful um, participants in the Summer Writing Across the Curriculum workshop. This is last year's graduating class. Um, the announcements for this um, are coming out fairly soon, probably in the next week. So if you're interested in joining us for a summer experience, it's a week long, four hours a day. Um, you get paid $750, you get books and supplies, and you get to hang out with 10 awesome faculty from across the disciplines, and we feed you many, many snacks. So what, what, what else could you be doing in June that would be better than this? So consider um, applying, and of course, you can always talk to the people who have done it for the last two summers. I think, you know, in general, they've had a really great experience, so talk to your colleagues. Okay, and without further ado, I'm going to hand this over. <coughs> All right, thank you. All right. So today we are going to begin with our three-part series uh, with understanding uh, IELTS and TOEFL scores and international student writing proficiency. So the first thing I want to do today uh, is a little activity to help increase our awareness of the language learners in your courses. So we're going to do a progressive circle story activity. And what's going to happen is we're going to start with one person, we're going to go around the room, and each person is going to say one sentence. And we'll go around our circle here in the room twice, um, and then we'll do it a second time. And in the second time we do it, you can't say any words that begin with the letter N. For those of you that are on Zoom, I want you to participate by listening to our circle story. 
um, the first version and the second version, and deciding um, what the vocabulary level is between the two stories, the ease of production, the pacing, um, things like that. What are some of the differences between the two stories? So we'll go ahead and uh, begin this activity, and I'm going to turn the camera so maybe you guys can see. I don't know. Okay, just turn it down a little bit. 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 Turn it and I was drinking my coffee. I burnt my mouth. So I ran to the sink and grabbed a glass of water. Unfortunately, I spilled it and went south from there. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we'll, we'll pause. I think one time around was good. Okay. So now this time we're going to repeat the story, but you can't use any words that have the letter N in them. Okay. Does it have to be the same story, or can we do? Oh, we can no, do a different story if you want to do a no, different I mean, story. Yeah, it doesn't have to be exactly if you don't remember exactly what you said, but or you can start with a whole new. So I can't use any word that starts with the letter N. Right. Okay. Upon learning that campus was upon. closed this morning. Upon. That's not upon. That's you, not N. It's letter N. The end of the word. The N. There's no a letter, letter N in the word. I, and in it. Oh. In the word. I'm questioning my spelling. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I thought, I thought it meant you could use a word that started with the letter N. No, you can't um, use any words with the letter N in anywhere in the word. <laughs> after learning that campus was closed. Okay. Learning. 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 Ah. <laughs> really good at this. Really glad the president is, is listening. Uh, <laughs> um, wow. Okay. After is a good start. After yeah. I. After I saw mm. the email which told me campus was closed while imbibing <laughs> my coffee <laughs> i scolded my mouth and <laughs> right. i should have brought my notebook <laughs> no. <laughs> next time <laughs> Left to the bridge for some water. The water was good. <laughs> Period. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So now that we did two stories, the second time obviously was a lot harder for us, um, more taxing for us to think about. Um, Zoom people, I want to hear from you. What did you observe in terms of um, how we were? Is this working? Um, how we were doing with vocabulary, ease of production, pacing. Um, details, things like that. What, what were you observing? If you could just write some things in the chat box. They can also can they turn their mics off yeah, would be great. Yeah, or, can, yeah if you want to just yeah, chime yeah. in, you can unmute yourself. If someone did actually reply in the chat. Do you see where it says more? And it's got an orange. Yep. There we go. There we go. So click oh. on it again. It, it hides itself sometimes. Yeah, just click the chat. There you go. There it is. Okay, excellent. So it looks like people are saying the speech was more halted. 
Um, second time was much slower, awkward, challenging for participants to complete. I'm glad I'm at home. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about every word. Yeah, that's true. Um, could tell the participants were having to think. Yeah, wanted to say, um, couldn't find the words. We knew what we wanted to say, but we couldn't find the words. Yeah, um, a lot more difficult uh, to express ourselves, to use intelligent thoughts. Um, those of you that were participating, how did you feel um, the second time around? I had significant performance anxiety <laughs> when I was buzzing other people like a main teacher. <laughs> the critic job is easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> the production is a little bit harder. Um, Very limited. Like I noticed that Zephra, when she got to the phrase and it all went south from there, which is, I mean, that's colloquialism. She just gave up on even reproducing that. You just said, and done. We're not even going to try to mm -hmm. right. deal with this phrase, and it all went south. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, I think the activity is really good because it illustrates how innate language is to the way you think. Mm -hmm. So you sort of you're very comfortable in letting that process happen, but when you actually have to be halted and shown that there are there's now a new rule, um, it becomes very difficult to even think. Right, it completely throws off. It's not just you're searching for words, it becomes really difficult even just to think. Yeah, excellent, definitely. Yeah, and so the reason I did this activity was um, to kind of point out that this is what our, our language learners are experiencing oftentimes when they're trying to access um, their cognitive academic language. And I point that out because as we saw as instructors, a student that is having to do that much processing to get their thoughts articulated are going to need some wait time. They're going to need a little bit more um, time to produce what they want to say. Um, and particularly with the academic language, um, they're really going to need a little bit of time uh, to produce that. So um, I want to introduce to you guys the uh, two terms, Bix and Calps. And these were coined by Jim Cummins. So BICs are basic interpersonal communication skills. And this is your basic conversational language. Um, it's very contextualized. You're in person, you get facial cues, you can hear tone, um, you know, inflection. You're able to see uh, gestures. You might even be seeing tangibles, like touching the table, you know what's this, or sit here, or um, you know, things that are just very contextualized, very easy, basic language. And that's the language that we first learn. Then as you progress in your language learning, you start to get to the CALPS, the Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency. And this is the more formal language. This is the stuff that takes a little more processing time. And um, it's generally not contextualized. It's um, through a reading or maybe through a lecture or something where you're not able to get all of the social cues and other cues that we might need to help us quickly understand meeting. So I point that out to say that um, our students are, uh, who have just reached the proficiency level to enter the undergrad are still working on their CALPS. Um, we see here that Thomas and Collier, they say that approximately it takes six months to two years to develop your BICs, that's your basic communication, and then it takes about four to seven years to gain that academic proficiency. Um, and they say that the strongest predictor, so I'm not, I'm kind of glazing over the <coughs> seven to 10 years bit with limited schooling, because all of our students that are coming into park don't have limited schooling. They've all completed high school and they've had to complete it with a 2.5 GPA or higher. And so our students are set up for the strongest predictor of success for second language acquisition. They have had that primary schooling in their, their first language, their L1, and all of those skills and schooling that they've learned in their L1 easily transfer then to <coughs> their L2, which is their second language that they're learning. And so, um, this is something that they're able to do uh, because they have that strong academic language in their first language. Um, and so we see here 
uh, exactly what PARC requires for an international student to enter into their undergrad program. And so this is their, their minimum requirement. Some students come in with higher than this, um, but we wanted to show you what the minimum was uh, just to show you that this is kind of the lowest type of student um, acquisition that you might experience in your class. And they would have to have a 2.5 on their GPA. They'd have to have a TOEFL score of a 69 or an IELTS score of a 5.5 or um, an ITEP of a 3.7. Or lastly, they could uh, be able to go into undergrad if they've completed the English Language and Culture Institute coursework. Um, so that is the general um, admissions requirements. Thanks, Amy. So um, what we're really focusing on today is what these scores mean. What do these scores mean? We know, Amy and I have been in the profession for a long time. We can feel that in our bones, what those scores mean. Um, so we want to give you a better idea of what those mean, and then maybe we're going to look at talking about how does that impact you as a teacher? How does that impact the way you maybe, the type of assignments you give, what you expect? So our students are coming in at, as I can't really point and let you see me at the same time, but you can see that arrow right about that 5.56, and that means that they're an independent <coughs> user of the language, okay, basically. And it's an important thing to remember that our school doesn't require specific band scores. So for example, they could maybe have a lot lower writing and reading ability than listening and speaking and still be able to come in at this level. Okay, and we, so some schools limit that you have to have this in all of your scores, but not ours. And then normal, these English tests, they test speaking, listening, reading, and writing, and then you get an overall score from those. That's the way they work. Um, do you mind clicking here? Okay, so the question is, what do those mean? Because that 69, that 5.5, um, what does that mean? And if you have any questions, feel free to turn off your microphone and just interrupt. So I'm happy for you to, to ask questions if you have any. What do they mean? Well, IELTS gives us a band descriptor for these. It's one of the tests. And it means that they're between a competent user and a modest user. And again, remember, their skills could be in either of those. Competent users. They have generally effective command of the language, despite some inaccuracies, um, inappropriacies, and misunderstandings. Can use and understand fairly complex language, particularly in familiar situations. And so that's important to kind of connect to that, particularly in familiar situations. That has a big impact on how well you deal with, with language. If you're in a situation, you know you're in your work. You have all that vocabulary. You know what you need to do. And if you look at the modest user, you can see a pretty big difference, um, has partial command of the language, coping with the overall meaning in most situations, though is, though is likely to make many mistakes, should be able to handle basic communication in own field. So again, our students can be in between, like Amy said, they could come in above. Okay, so. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, IELTS gives a recommendation for universities, and Amy was going to talk a little bit about that and what that means. So you can see here on this chart um, what IELTS says a 5.5 student can, uh, you can expect them to be able to do linguistically. So it says that you can expect them to linguistically be able to do less demanding training programs. Um, but as soon as we move over into things that start to become a little more linguistically demanding, you see that there's still some English study needed. Um, and we're pointing this out to you because the linguistically demanding pieces, those are the CALPs. That's your cognitive academic language. And we saw from Thomas and Collier that it takes a little bit longer to develop that CALP language. And so, um, they're, they're continuing as they're in our undergrad programs to develop that cognitive language, um, that academic language. And so uh, just wanted you to be aware that that's still happening while they're in your classrooms. But I also want to say that um, our students are really um, set up well to be able to academically perform because they've had that strong L, L1, um, you know, uh, high school performance where they were able to academically perform and all of those things transfer then to their L2. And um, I know 
Glenn Lester did a, a thing recently about transfer and uh, in the FCI series. And I'm pointing that out only to say that those students who are bilingual and multilingual are, they've learned how to transfer those skills naturally. And that taps into your metacognitive skills. And so these are things that help language learners perform at a higher uh, performance rate oftentimes than monolingual peers. So even though they're still working on that cognitive academic language, they really are set up for success and they're able to, um, their aptitude is there and they're able to actually perform well. Um, so I don't want this to scare you away and think, oh, they can't do this. They can. Um, it's just that they're still working on that. So they're doing double time in your class. They're working on um, their proficiency while they're also learning academic content. And some of your academic content might be new to them. They might not have learned that in their L1. And so that's where you're gonna start seeing some of those processing, um, you know, demanding time delays like we saw in our circle activity. Um, but our students are definitely, um, set up for success and they can um, succeed. And in this series of workshops, we'll begin to see, um, dig a little bit deeper into some ways that we can help um, them to continue to learn that academic language, making things more accessible for them. So we're gonna take a look now at an IELTS writing task. And this writing task is very similar to what you would see on the TOEFL or on the ITEP. They're all quite similar. Um, TOEFL has uh, a writing task that also um, has like a, a listening component to it as well. Um, and it's more of an integrated writing task, but then they also have um, just a traditional writing task like this one. And so we see here writing task two example. Um, Jack, can I have you read this one out loud? Would you read it out loud? The whole thing? Just writing task two, just the task, yeah. Like the the assignment? Yep. The slide, okay. Um, you can spend about 40 minutes on this task, write about the following topic. Nowadays, the way many people interact with each other has changed because of technology. In what ways has technology affected the types of relationships people make? Has this become a positive or negative development? Give reasons for your answer and include any relevant examples from your own knowledge or experience. Write at least 250 words. Great. So this is a, a pretty uh, straightforward common task that you see. And they score it based on the four items that are in um, red there. The task achievement, which um, when they're scoring on this, they're looking for, um, are you addressing all parts of the task? Um, are they on topic? And then the second item, coherence and cohesion, this is where they're looking for that connection of ideas. Um, the, the coherence is kind of your macro level of ideas, the rhetorical items um, where, you know, can they make a, an argument and support it? Are they able to organize their, their thoughts well? Are they able to put together a good thesis? Um, and the cohesion is more of your macro things, um, like your grammatical aspects of the writing, um, connecting the ideas to the sentence level. So that's what they're looking at when they look at lexical uh, or coherence and cohesion. And then when they look at the lexical resource, they're looking at vocabulary. So um, what level of vocabulary they're using, um, how good is their choice in, in choosing the vocabulary they're using, and then the command of the spelling. Is the spelling interfering with meaning or understanding of the words? Um, and then the last thing they look for are the grammatical range and accuracy. And this is more about your sentence structure, the grammar, punctuation, kind of those finer details. So in thinking about um, those four categories of how a student's writing is viewed and how it's um, scored for their proficiency, I want you to think about a writing assignment that you would give in your course that might be similar to this task. So something where they don't have time to revise their writing or giving a, a certain period of time. It might be an in-class task that they're doing and have to hand in at the end of class, or it might be on an, uh, a test or an exam where they have a limited amount of time to respond and write and get back. Um, and so think about a task similar to this that you would have in your course 
And what would be your expectations around how a student in your class should be performing when they address task achievement or addressing coherence, cohesion, lexical resource, or the grammatical range and accuracy? So what are your expectations for a student responding to a writing piece in those four areas in your course? So I want you to turn and talk to somebody next to you. Those people in Zoom, maybe just jot down a few ideas about what your expectations would be. And in a minute, we're gonna share out what those expectations are. So I'll give you um, about five minutes here to turn to a partner and discuss those four areas, what your expectations might be. Okay. Hey, partner. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah, thank you. You have good projections, so you're like, you're like perfect for the microphone. <clears throat> You know what's interesting is this is a lot like the WSL. This is a similar task. Mm -hmm. task is very similar to this. The okay. difference really is that we give them a little bit of it so that they can you know, make use of But we ask them to do a similar thing. They have four minutes. Mm -hmm. We give them a question. And yeah. they open it and they have to stay in the position. And then it goes for our undergrads and to support the answer to freeze numbers for us. I know in my class, I do something. It's actually funny because yeah. I'm doing something similar because I, I have students Right, what are supposed to be short sort of case study papers, like a couple of pages, and they're really, really, they're kind of like, I would see at this for some reason, like they're completely, the whole concept of a reflection paper seemed alien to them. <laughs> so what I've been doing is giving them these shorter in-class versions of that, where they take 250 words and they have to, inside class, create an, an argumentative position that uses a case, uses an example, uses a concept, and makes an argument. And I, I think that doing that has shown me when it comes to task achievement, I suppose there's two things going on. There's like what they have to do to get through, right, to meet the expectation. But then there's also what I'm looking for them for to denote like an Excel, like a B, a high B or an A kind of answer. Um, and to just to be done is to be able to sort of cobble together a point, right, that sort of says technology, it has changed this, this, and this. So my answer to the question is yes. Um, but the higher order stuff is like a particular point that's synthetic, that brings those constituent points together. Um, and I'm already immediately seeing how for us, English as a second language learner, the, the grammatical range and then their their vocabulary is really going to stand in the way of their ability to do that, right? So, like, immediately, whether or not they can be synthetic in their thought or not is not, it may not be immediately apparent in their brain. Right. So that's... In terms of the classes we teach, I think we would have the expectation of 40 minutes that they can express a point mm -hmm. that they... We would assume, even in first year writing, that the students can provide support and um, examples and anecdotal support mm -hmm. if you do in 40 minutes i don't think i'd have the expectation that it would be grammatically clean but it should mm. be readable right because they can't this, revise how is this test taken is it typed or is it handwritten this is typed she's typed I mean, okay. yeah i'm pretty sure well, IELTS yeah. is written, or oh, there's a lot of written exams when the writing still, but TOEFL has the, we have, yeah, yeah, TOEFL, TOEFL, TOEFL is on the type, so that is an interesting, yeah, yeah. a lot of I mean, IELTS is still written. I touch type, so I always have to like walk back my expectation for how so much somebody can type inside a few, yeah. few minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not that I'm all that fast at it, to, to us, yeah. it makes yeah. a difference, but like, yeah, that would also matter, right, because yeah. 40 minutes to me, Depending on the de well, depending on the yeah. mode they're doing it, with it is long enough to start expecting to see a little bit of attempt to clean up their not to make it perfect, but to clean up their grammar. So you expect, um, but if they're handwriting it, then it's not. Um, right. You you would. In your course, what are they doing? Are they handwriting? They have the option. Most of them type. Um, and then I normally let them. Yeah. Elect someone. They're in the same groups, and we, we rotate. 
So they sort of share the responsibility of maybe cleaning it up before they submit it. I don't make it do at the end of class. Like I let them have it for a couple days so someone can fix it. But right. yeah, I mean the time constraints. And then what's your so like so that? But it would still need to be lucid. That's the thing. Like some students, it's just not even lucid. Like it's like there are sentences. Not all those sentences are complete or clear. Um, which is not to say that it would be. It needs to be perfect to be understandable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of flexible resource, especially if you're thinking handwriting forty minutes in class, I don't. I would not have as high of expectations for flexible. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, complexity. Yeah. Simply yeah. because I know from my own experience that if I dash something off by hand, it's probably going to be <clears throat> a little more conversational. Mm -hmm. Right, a little less a academic language, yeah. less language, right? If I spend a lot of time on something, I think that's where the five dollar work would be in. Right, yeah. I've got time to think about the right words. I expect them to be able to use the key term or concept that they're they're, they're using. That's it. Like I don't expect their the written work to be all that wordy or Latinate or anything. But like if they're you if they're saying institutions do this and the, this equals this, this, this. I expect them to be able to use the term that they're they're talking about, but that's it. I, I don't really expect a sort of broad. I don't expect more than one. I don't expect a bunch of them. Just uh, the content related. Yeah, the like if they're using if they're using a concept from constitutional design to talk about how ethnic groups can coexist with the state. Like I expect them to be able to tell me the concept that they're using. Um, there's a bunch of other opportunities, like you said, if they had more time, where other terms would creep in, but I don't expect that from them. Um, but that's a good point about you're still probably thinking most of this time, so it's going to end up being far more conversational. That's how my first drafts always are. Mm -hmm. I, I write it like an hour say no about it. I have to go back and because you're an undergrad course. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can pull, see if people want to chat or unmute and tell us, the folks online, what they yep. think. Yeah. I feel like they're getting a really good uh, listen to mm -hmm. Jeff and I chatting. Um, <coughs> all right. If people want to, yeah, unmuting would be great. We'd love to hear. From people. Hi, this is Matt out of Fairchild. How are you? Oh, hi. Great. Hi. <laughs> I, I decided to step in and watch this because while we don't have international students out here, we have many GIs that are, English is a second language. Oh. Um, watching them perform in a classroom it seems like there's a gap. And so I thought maybe watching this would be is how to shrink that. Can you repeat that last part of that? Well, we, we have a lot of military members where English is a second language, but they're not coming through the international student process. They're coming in as a regular student. Oh, interesting. Um, and so, um, you know, if they're working on, in, in case of a CCF requirement, they could take MG 371 as an introductory course without Ooh. having other college work. And the level of product is not where you would expect it for a 300 level course. Right, and, absolutely. And so mm -hmm. we, we find ourselves out in the system here challenged that way. And I'm just looking for some ideas on how to bridge that gap. Yeah, and we're going to absolutely, our next two uh, parts in this series are going to be focused on that, on helping you when you spot that, being able to have resources to help them get where they need to be. And I think that's really important. And we're hoping today that you'll understand more when you're spotting the student that you realize this is a big problem. Um, and then we're hoping to give you some practical um, tips in the next two sessions and we're also happy as well so Amy and I are here and if you ever feel if you would like to you know arrange a conference call or something I would be really happy to sit down with you and talk to you about the particular issues you see or with the professors that teach that class thank you sure yeah thanks for sharing would anyone um, like to talk about task achievement and what they expect to do Amy and 
Well, I would say, I mean, just thinking about my students in general, I, I would expect them to be able to articulate a point that's relevant to the question and that they can pull up some examples, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's a common task, certainly in high school writing in the United States. So in terms of expectations, I would expect them, most of them, to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. right? And we know from the writing skills inventory, which is a very similar task to this, that the, most of our incoming students can do that, mm -hmm. or at least the ones who take the writing skills inventory. Because okay. they're not, they don't always fill it in, but if they do it, <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Would anybody else like to share? Let's talk about coherence and cohesion. Is it similar that you have pretty high expectations that things will make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's kind of like with the task achievement, there's a difference between like achieving and excelling, right? Yes. Um, I, I feel because I, I, when I worked in a writing center at my last institution, one of the intro English papers was that question. And most papers were, able to say, well, technology makes social interaction better, but it's hurt my attention span. So I guess it's yes and no. Um, and then there are very few students who could actually pull that together into like a social commentary that says like, technology has changed the way we think about each other. And it runs through both of these things in the same way. And it comes out the other end as a particular like declarative point, like, yes, this is good or no, this is bad. Um, with coherence and cohesion, I mean, I think that that also, the two kind of go together, but I, of course you separate them for this reason, that coherence is one thing, that they can articulate a point, mm -hmm. that you actually when you're done, you, you sort of know what they were trying to say. Um, and in a sense, when they do that well, is when somebody like a writing center can be really effective, because they, the person can see it and say, this is what you're trying to say, right? Um, cohesion is a different thing because if it's if it's not if it's not coherent and it doesn't fit together that even becomes difficult where you're not even entirely sure what it is they're trying to say mm -hmm. um, so I guess I mean again there's there's the importance of having I guess maybe the lesson is to start to be really cognizant of the fact that not everybody's going to excel and to be really mindful of where you're drawing that line. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sitting here thinking about how we always go looking for the best. And then the sort of acceptable and sometimes um, above acceptable stuff sort of fills itself in. But you have to be more cognizant of where you're drawing that line because you're gonna end up with students who come in around that in ways that you might not be expecting. Yeah, that's a really good point. And we were talking about, um, could you share what you were saying about the expectations for um, grammatical accuracy and it might, and maybe for coherence and cohesion about just a different mindset when you know you're dealing with a non-native and. Sure, um, so with my ESL students, I typically go a little bit more lenient with them only because I, I fully, cognizant that um, they have um, what are called verb conjugations that they have to deal with that we don't. So um, it's a little bit harder for them to translate that than we do. Um, so when I'm like reviewing their papers and stuff, I, I uh, take that into consideration. So um, mm -hmm. English students, you know, they've done that their whole life. I would say, if we think about this task being 40 minutes and unrevised, mm -hmm. even native speakers in English will still commit a number of grammatical errors. Yeah, we hope they revise it in the 40 minutes. You know, 40 minutes yeah. doesn't give you yeah. time. No, you have, to, really, you have to really plan. It's, it's, and, it's yeah. also pretty general that you get first year students, non native or native speakers, who mm -hmm. are blown away by the prospect that they can fix answers <laughs> on an exam. Yeah. yeah. Like, wait, what? Yeah, break double space, cross stuff out, fix it. Wait, I can do that? Yeah, <laughs> it's recommended actually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Would, yeah, would anybody else like to share their expectations with for as they relate to their own courses they teach? Any Zoom people want to chime in? <laughs> okay, we've got a question. <clears throat> 
What if there wasn't a 40 minute time limit? Would expectations change? I think that's a really good question. Maybe I'll answer and I'll let you answer it for your own experience. Um, it's interesting because I think that actually, and you'll see when we look at the sample, that a lot of the basic issues are, will be the same. Um, and although you would expect more development, and maybe fewer errors, you wouldn't see as many changes overall as you might expect. Um, because the things that it requires to do detailed analysis and things like that still won't be there, or are there or aren't there. So they're there in this 40 minute task, or they aren't. And they're still not there in a, when you have a week to do it, although it depends on how that person can use other resources to help improve. But it's interesting that without the time limit, um, I've found you can still see a lot of the same issues coming up. And I don't know if you experienced that yourselves in your classes. What do you think, Amy, the impact of that time limit? So, I mean, I think sometimes people think about um, language proficiency and language development as um, similarly to how people might sometimes think of a disability and they think oh well if I give them an accommodation of being able to have extra time then they'll be able to develop this a little bit better and maybe certain aspects they could develop a little bit better they might have more time to plan so you might see the task achievement a little bit better because they're able to address all parts of the task instead of just some of the task. Or um, you might see a little bit more of the like coherence piece where they're able to kind of connect their ideas a little bit better or maybe make a little bit better argument by adding some more, um, you know, just wordage in general. But I think um, like Zephyr is pointing out, that if a student is having a language error or if they you know are are demonstrating what their current proficiency is giving them more time won't necessarily change where they're currently at um, linguistically and so um, you know it's it's limited to 250 words so probably not going to see a whole lot of difference uh, maybe some things i think um, you know, and thinking about, you know, your normal course assignments in like an English class, um, they would start out with a task like this, and then over time they would begin to revise it. And in our language classrooms, you know, we would take a task like this and we would see, okay, they need a little more help with this particular grammatical structure. And so then we would give them a lesson on that and then expect a change then. But I think in that moment where they're at right there without instruction or without time to go to a tutor or something like that, you're probably not going to see any changes. And I think that's the important thing of if they have help from someone else, you'll definitely see a difference and you'll know it, right? I mean, we all have experience with that probably with our international students. You know they're getting help from someone else, tutors, friends a lot of times, um, and that's that that would you could see a major change but if they're sitting on their own with just their own resources um, and maybe not trained in using language resources appropriately then yeah that's right that's a great question does anybody else have any more questions or comments Okay, so is it fair to hold fluent students to a higher standard than non-fluent students? Should we hold all students to the same standard? I think this is a wonderful point of discussion for all of us, and I don't want to pretend that I have an answer to this in my position here at Park, um, but I think it's really important that we're dialoguing about this with yeah. each other, with the university, and with, within the university community because this is an ongoing issue. And I think also, just so that we can um, you know, move forward with today's lesson, I would just note that um, we had planned to address this sort of more fully in the third workshop when we yes. are addressing um, helping students with their writing through feedback. 
because I think that's really where we start to wonder like what do we do when students have you know language issues and how do we hold them accountable but not sort of punish them for not having the same resources as native speakers in English right yeah and so yes. come back for part three yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll be addressing that more, but excellent and very important question. Yeah, are there any other questions before we move on? Okay, so at this point, at this point, we're going to be looking at, those are your expectations, so why don't we look at, from our perspective um, of understanding language learners, what can they actually do? What is achievable when you come in at that 5.5 or 69, the, the bottom of the threshold? So first of all, um, I can read it off here, sorry. We have some can-do statements and we use these to say that at this level, this is actually what the student can achieve. And I think these are really helpful so that you can know this is within the possibility, how can I work within that? So first of all, can, and these are specifically for study situations, these have been written for that. So, can write a simple narrative or description, for example, my last holiday, with some inaccuracies in vocabulary and grammar. And now, I think the question about time was good because these can do's are not connected to time. This is just what can you achieve. Can present, um, if you go a little higher in the level, can present arguments, use a limited range of expression, vocabulary, grammatical structures, lecture and talks, can write down some information at a lecture if this is more or less dictated or written on the board. Mm -hmm. A little bit higher, can begin to make notes in a second foreign language that will be of some limited use for essay or revision purposes. Um, reference skills, can make simple notes from written sources and a little higher, can make notes from simple sources that will be some limited use for essay or revision purposes. So I think these are good answers to that question again about the time because when we're saying, oh, we've given them more time, well, but this is still what they're capable of within the time. And of course, a lot of writing is connected to how you're using references. So at this point, we'd love to get you guys seeing what an actual student achieved on that task. Um, so I'm going to pull this up on here so people on Zoom can see it. Okay. And this is a real answer to the test. This is a real student. All the errors and everything are there. Um, and I'd like you to take some time just to look it over and think about those two questions. What do I see that encourages me in this task for this bottom level of language proficiency we require? And what do I see that worries me in this level? Okay, and this is just to remind you, this is a response to the question that we read about technology. And um, if you would like, we also have on the next slide, the examiner's comment on the task. Okay, so take some time. Okay. And And as you're coming up with ideas, please feel free to write them in the chat um, and we can talk together in the room as well. And you can unmute yourself and comment too.
So I'm going to give people in the room a chance to discuss um, together with what they came up and then if anyone would like to go ahead and start in the chat a few of those answers to your questions of what do I see that encourages me or worries me and again feel free to unmute if you'd like. Okay. <coughs> Yeah, okay. Well, so taking your cue from the can do's, mm -hmm. which I think is a good way to approach this. What can they do? Oh, what are we doing? Are we doing oh. small or big? Oh, small. I guess small. Okay. Okay, sorry. Well, now I'm just talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, so we can maybe do it all together because it's a small group here. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say that taking the cue from you all with the can do's, mm -hmm. which I think is sort of a productive way to look at this because I feel like if I have to look at what they can do, mm -hmm. I'm a little less distracted by what they can't do. It's like having the positive frame of mind, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that I noted is um, in terms of my expectations of all my students that can respond appropriately to the task. This is an answer to the question. Mm -hmm. It's clear they understand what they've been asked. And it's an appropriate response. Mm -hmm. So that's encouraging. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Anything in the I'm, chat? I'm not sure how to. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. as the as the the greater uh, points out, um, they are able to identify like different periods of time in the text. We talk about change over time. Um, to draw comparisons um, as a way of making their thoughts clear, which is not always something somebody can do in a, in a, in a second language, right? Mm -hmm. Just to be able to create those sort of differentiated points of view. Um, so they can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Mary Burkhart says, I'm encouraged because I understand exactly what he's trying to convey. Yes. What worries me a bit are the problems with grammar, punctuation, and spelling. That's something we can all relate to, I think, right? Yeah. And that can be very distracting for a reader. Even a trained reader, that can be very distracting, but good, yeah. yes. Um, Monica Brannon says that I'm encouraged that there seems to be a thesis statement in a direct line of thinking. Mm -hmm. What worries me is that some points are lost to the language. Yeah, yeah. okay. Such as the statement about the professional level. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, but we understand what you're thinking, and there are times when I don't know what you mean. <laughs> the yeah. good question comment comes in when you're leaving feedback. Okay. Yeah, the, the synthetic point that I'm always looking for out of my students isn't there, where they're like, yeah, it's different. We could talk to people who are far away, mm -hmm. um, which is what a lot of students do, like Valid. whether they are ESL or not. Um, but what, what worries me is that even if the student is thinking, like, it's changed the way we talked about each other and we've, that's changed the way we uh, consider things like love and relationships and so on, because they, they hint at that somewhere where they say about, well, yes. once upon a time, you wouldn't actually tell your loved one um, what you actually think because, you know, they said it was an insecure motive, like it's not, you know, somebody might open that, somebody might see that. <laughs> Which yes. I think is kind of hysterical in the world of <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, internet, where everything uh, where yeah, everything is to write personal feedback. Um, but like they're hinting at it, and what worries me is that it's not coming through. Like in it, it mm -hmm. the student and I, I as an instructor can't really give them the benefit of the doubt because I'm not sure. I'm not yeah. sure if that's what they mean, or as Monica said, it's just lost in the language. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I, yeah. yeah. I think that's that's a, a good observation. And I, you know, the other day I had a student that I've been working with say to me, um, and who's coming at a low level proficiency, is working really hard, and he said, "It's like being trapped in a box." Yeah. And I thought that that is really good. And maybe some of you have had a language learning experience. I myself have had a language learning mm -hmm. experience, and you are trapped in a box in lots of ways because you are this fully developed adult, well, okay, again, we're talking about college students, so we're flexible, you know, they're on their journey, but you're this developed person in your own language, and then all of a sudden, language can, can constrict. Mm -hmm. And so you're opening this box, those kelps, because you're describing those, the deeper, we're talking about academic language here, because maybe they've opened the box of the interpersonal 
communication more. So you're stuck in here and you have these ideas, and I see this all the time in the writing center with my non-natives. You've got these ideas, but actually you don't have the proficiency to express complex ideas. We saw that in our can-dos. And so thinking about continuing to encourage your students to simplify, which can be frustrating because I have this great idea, but I can't say it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind just as we continue this discussion. Um, and Kathy says that she's encouraged by the vocabulary and the ability to address the question in a developed way. What would worry me only is if there was, um, yeah, if this was in a business setting or healthcare when documentation can, yeah, be a legal setting would reflect on professionalism. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Having lived in a foreign country, frankly, I couldn't write in that language to this detail. Yeah. <laughs> With, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> impressed and also we're impressed, we have a good feeling, but what is required? Well, in this setting, that could be a problem. And as we're training students, we, we're thinking about the standards. I think that's really good insight. Did anybody else, Amy? Well, I just uh, saw on the can't do side or the thing that concerns me side. Mm -hmm. One of the things I noticed about this is you go through it and you go, yeah, I know what you're saying. But if you really sit down and analyze what they've achieved, really it's repetitive. The, the student really hasn't gone anywhere with this idea that technology makes communication faster. In fact, they just kind of repeat it over and over again. In fact, if you look at the last two sentences, what are they saying in those two sentences that they didn't already say? Mm -hmm. Right. So, and I can't, I can't decide if this is a language issue or a development issue because we yeah. certainly see students who don't know what it means mm -hmm. to develop a point that also default to just let's repeat the point in a different way. Right. Yeah. But I can imagine having limited linguistic resources might make the development part even harder. Yeah. Right? I think mm -hmm. sometimes it's repeating there at the end, and I think in other languages people write differently and in terms of how they organize things and how they would end something. And I think when you're learning English, you're taught that the standard way to end something is with a summary. And a summary sentence is kind of like repeating the yeah. stuff before. Yeah, yeah. And it feels a little bit like they're not quite understanding how to write a summary, but they're repeating and they think that that's what it is. And so, I don't know, to, uh, yeah, that's just something that occurs to me. Yeah. That maybe this American style of writing with an introduction, supporting paragraphs, and conclusion. And frankly, writing. conclusion, intro, introduction and conclusion writing take a high level of skill. As I'm sure our English teachers know, and we deal with it a lot in the writing center, how do I write an introduction? How do I write my conclusion? And then, of course, if you're working in a second language, that skill is going to take a lot of time to develop. And yeah, that absolutely. I know I should say it again. Oh, no, I'm out of vocabulary. Now what do I do? <laughs> well, I would go so far as to say we all struggle with that when you're trying to form your own thoughts. It's very easy to identify a good introduction and conclusion to someone else's work. Absolutely. Their own work is, but I mean, I think that to go back to your point about exposure to other languages, um, I can sort of see what the student is trying to, like they keep trying to conjugate verbs that don't need to be conjugated. And they're a little bit confused about the role of modifiers in relationship to various other parts of the sentence. And if it's an English speaker, I just circle that and walk away from it because the student probably knows that that's not the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, or when they read it back to themselves, go, oh yeah, that doesn't make sense. But like, yes, the technology has changed. If I'm grading that and I'm not aware that this is an ESL student, I'm probably just going to circle that and yeah. keep going. And then they're going to get the I'm stuck in a box because they don't, might not immediately know why that's not the way it should be. Um, so I think that that might come back to that point about treating them differently. Maybe not expectation-wise, but yeah. like how you address the things that they do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we're focusing a whole session on feedback because I think it, in that, I mean, personally, you definitely, okay, wait, let me try. Oh, that was too strong. It's a really good idea. <laughs> Sorry. It's a really good idea to educate yourself of how you can help give feedback that will help them achieve that. Like you said, the circle might work when you know a student's a native and well-developed in their writing. 
and it's going to be really fun to work on the feedback session because I think you're going to see things like, oh yeah, I can do that. Yes, this will help. And you might see a positive difference in that. That's really, yeah. Would anybody else like to comment on this? What's happening with this camera? I don't know. Yeah, if you yeah. wanted to focus on you, you just got to turn it back around. Yeah. I don't know. Yep, okay. Excellent. There you go. Face it towards you. <laughs> oh, it's upside down. I think you flipped it it's over. Like, it's so like flip trying it back. to give a presentation it's around in a no, cosmic novel. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> There's like 10 steps that don't make any sense. It doesn't seem like they need to be here. Oh my gosh. For those of you who are online, we apologize. The, the camera in the ceiling just isn't working. I'm so sorry. So we're making do as best we can. <laughs> That should have been the real ending to 1984. Sorry, the camera in the sky doesn't work. Oh, what is this? <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, and I, if you would like to take a look at what the examiner says, um, a lot of the things you pointed out, they say. Mm -hmm. They address both questions, but the first is not well covered. There is a clear opinion. With some relevant ideas, there is general progression. There's also repetition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And quite a lot of mistakes, but they don't usually reduce understanding. So, yeah. But the thing that I noticed is that the grader is very interested in whether or not the person can clearly state the point they have. Mm -hmm. The grader is not in any way, because it's not their role, participating in an evaluation of the quality of the argument. Absolutely. Which, which is completely speaks opposite. speaks kind of what Tamonica brought up, which is that this might not be a great argument because it's not fully developed, but that's not what the test is. And it's what's worrying is that you're not quite sure then if it's a writing problem or if it's a thinking problem. That's, I think, a really good point. It's really blurred. And the, total, yeah. the, the test is not going to help you. And when, yeah, when I'm training the yeah. students for the test, I remind them always, this is, the examiner doesn't care what you think. It does, but if you can support your argument, you do need to be able to support an argument. But it does, this is not a test of ideas, and that's a good point that's a yeah. different. But again, the language level, you reach a language level where you can support the ideas. That's the yeah. point is you can, and like we said, you get that to that higher, a little bit higher, and you can support an argument. A little bit lower, and you can't support an argument. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, great. So we talked about earlier your expectations with me. Um, we looked at um, you know, what you thought a student might be able to do or what you're expecting them to be able to do in your class in terms of a, a writing assignment like this. And then Zephra showed you an actual response, an actual reality of somebody who would be coming in at that, um, just at that cutoff level. Um, and so we're wondering what you think now we need in terms of a bridge between your expectations and what a student can do right now. That's not to say that they can't do more than that a month from now or two months from now, but in, in just looking at where we're at right now, your expectations and what that student comes in with at the beginning of your class, certainly if they're taking you a uh, class with you for a full semester, we're expecting that that language is going to continue to build and develop. Um, but right in that moment, that snapshot, <clears throat> what do we need to bridge between your expectation? Like what, what do students um, need to work on? Or what are some areas that you feel like um, would need addressed in order to get a student of a 5.5 up to your expectations for what they can do? I'm going to let you guys think about that for a few minutes, and then I'm going to come back to your ideas about how we can bridge that gap. And I'll also say that I suspect a lot of the things that you say will be things that we're going to be addressing in our two upcoming sessions. Um, so don't feel like you're saying something and you're not really sure how to make that happen. We'll help you um, with strategies on how to make that happen. So what are some things <coughs> students will need from their reality now to your expectation? Zoom people, feel free to come <coughs> in the box, and I'll check the box. Amy, will you rephrase the question? 
Yeah. yeah thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so in thinking about uh, where the student is at right now with that writing sample that you just saw, um, we just saw what they can do. Um, and then earlier you talked about your expectation, like what you expect a student to be able to perform with in your class. Mm -hmm. So how can we <coughs> kind of bridge that gap? What do you think a student with this writing sample needs in order to reach your expectation? What are they missing? What do they need to, to work on to get to where it, what you expect? And maybe we can talk a little bit about was there a gap between your expectation you and the reality and the reality. Do you think between what I expected out of the answer or what I would expect out of a really great answer? That's a very good question. <laughs> because as far as like what I would expect from like a first year student answering a writing prompt under pressure, it's not that far outside of what I would start thinking about giving a C or some version of that, but it's far outside what I would give an A to. Um, which means that my answer to helping them navigate between expectation and reality, there's like there's two things that has to happen. Um, one, I have to be very aware of the fact that they're an ESL student and give them feedback that's probably more targeted um, and illustrates that I'm there to help them. <laughs> um, there's nothing more frustrating than dabbling in a new language and coming across somebody who's intolerant of your inability to speak mm -hmm. their language um, or doesn't seem to be interested in helping you or making you feel good about trying. Um, but then that helps hopefully gets them to a point where you can be sort of more banal with them as a thorn move for where they just become another one of the students and then you're working on argumentative structure. And, mm -hmm. Right, realizing that they're two separate things in this case, whereas in, for some native speakers, it might be the same thing. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with one problem, which is just sitting down and writing um, more diligently, which for them, it's, there's two things happening. Yeah, right. I think it's sort of interesting as someone who teaches first year writing, so I teach writing to our incoming students who are new, um, that a lot of what I would expect out of them and then what you see in the writing sample it are things we do teach in first year writing because we know that students come in from high schools, they don't know how to write a clear thesis that begins a piece. Like the student writes themselves into a point of view. Mm -hmm. We see that pretty commonly with our freshmen, right? Or um, they don't really understand what it means to develop an argument and not just repeat the same point, right? So. On one hand, I'm kind of encouraged to know that like, oh, well, you know, they're just lacking a lot of skills our first year writers are already <laughs> lacking. Um, and we, we try to teach those skills in a targeted way. I just don't know, you know, I teach writing, so I have the, the time and the leisure, right, to, to, to directly teach those lessons. Like, what does it mean to develop an argument? What are some strategies for doing that? Um, I don't know if I were teaching, you know, sort of a non-writing class, do I have time to do that in every single class period? I don't know, right? Yeah. And anybody out there who's teaching, so you're teaching 300 level management, the classes like that, they really, they're not, you know, the focus isn't on developing arguments. We assume that they can do this as 300 level something. You know, how does that affect seeing that sample and what you expect of me, and this is what a student can achieve. And anyone else as well that's teaching these a little higher level classes, not in the English um, faculty. You know, when you point out the resources that are available for a 300 level management class, uh, one of the basic resources I use is the rubric right in the syllabus, and most students don't even look at it. And it yeah. pretty much gives you a roadmap. Here's what you need to do to get an A. Here's what you need to do to pass the class. Here's what happens if you don't, and you're paying back your tuition assistance. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. what, what I found is in, in my particular class, I, I actually put a YouTube video up just how to format a Word document for APA format. That's how basic I had to go. And was that a response to um, students that hadn't experienced 
um, sourcing writing before, you know, use, working with references, or was that a response to people coming from other countries with different standards? Of it, it was native speakers. Uh, mm -hmm. There was one English as a second language person in the class, mm -hmm. um, but none of them had any of the, the introductory English courses. This was their first college class because there was no prereq, and it was a management class they needed oh. from community college of the Air Force, and it's like, ah! <laughs> that's it that's really interesting and that's a, that's another really good point is that it depends on their and where they're entering mm -hmm. you know if they happen to have come through our 100 level classes or not yeah and so you found yourself making some serious adaptations to the way you were presenting it absolutely absolutely the targeted excellent well, hopefully we'll be able to help you even more to um when you see non-native speakers that you can spot are struggling to help give them the kind of feedback and look at those rubrics and the prompt, which as you said, they are roadmaps. <laughs> I mean, I work at the writing center, so I laugh because I see these all the time. And a lot of times, yes, students aren't looking at them or they don't know how to use them. And it's especially important, I think, when we look at the sample writing that you need to have understood the instructions first. And so we're really going to look at those as a way of supporting students as well and how to make those more accessible. So hopefully that just adds more tools to your tool belt of getting these students that yeah, enter these higher level classes to where they need to go so that they can achieve. Yeah. Yeah, I would also echo the, the rubric comment. Um, I, I've stated in my class multiple times Pay attention to the rubric um, because that's what I grade off of. If you look, you'll notice I, I put that in Canvas for a reason. I graded based off of the rubric. Have you looked at the rubric over half the classes? No. Have you looked at the comments that I've put on your paper? I put them there for a reason. No. <laughs> And they keep making the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. if, maybe if you pay attention to the comments, then your writing will improve. Mm -hmm. it, it's not, I don't ask you these rhetorical questions for a reason. I don't actually fix your grammatical errors for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's to help you improve. It's to help you think critically. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just part of the expectations that I have. Yeah. And I think that's fair. That's really good is that talking about those expectations in the feedback that we get. We all, I mean, when you're teaching, you have an expectation that your feedback will be taken into account and put into action. You know, and I've seen professors, because I'm in the writing center, you see professors. I see you having to address any of the comments. So this is, you know, unchanged. But I think that when you're working with non natives, it's good to look at that feedback from that perspective and say, can they, knowing what we do now about these can-do statements, can they use the feedback that I've given them to put this into change? Am I asking them to change something they actually can't do, do any, that it's out of their can-dos? So I think that's really good and I think that it will be um, interesting to work together towards more effective um, feedback for students that are not native speakers. And I also would just say, we're going to address this in the prompt workshop, but um, preparing for this has really changed my perspective on a lot of things. And I had a, I had a um, non-native speaker of English in my 300 level business writing class, and we kept having this misunderstanding about when things were due. And I was really frustrated because there's a calendar, it's on Canvas. I thought it was clear. I laid it out in this table format, so it's Monday, Wednesday, and it's all listed. And the student kept missing the deadlines and kept saying, well, I didn't know it was due. And I'd be like, you know, the calendar is there. Why aren't you looking at the calendar? And he actually pulls it out of this folder. He had it printed out, but he's literally just having trouble navigating the document, right? And I never got to the bottom of why that is, but it was clear that there was something about the reading of the document that was, you know, he is looking at the document. I had something about the way I wrote the items or laid it out have confused him and he can't get it right yeah and it just it was like this weird moment for me i'm like well he is accessing it but he can't figure it out now and mm -hmm. so yeah 
Yeah, and a lot of times I'll, with students, I'll, we'll look at the professor's comments and then my first question is, so what do they mean by that? And then the student says, I have no idea. <laughs> so I think that's a good thing to know. And that's why you know Amy and I are here. It's a good thing to know. Oh, what? You can't read my calendar? Why? What, I put this comment and you have no idea what I'm talking about? Well, that's frustrating. I've wasted my time. So yeah. It'll, it'll change the way you look at things. Right. Okay, it looks like we've got a couple items in the chat box. We'll take a look at those. Um, providing examples of papers, um, what uh, have a clear argument, evidence, and expected structure may be helpful in bridging the gap. Great. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. That's very helpful for non-natives. Very helpful. Yep. yep. So yeah. they can extrapolate things from a really good ex student example. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. that yeah, that's a great strategy, and oftentimes we use that in our language classroom as well. We'll show them a good example, a bad example, and talk about you know those kinds of differences. Um, that's definitely really helpful. Um, we also have a comment here, um, that's why I like using Dear Reader letter that Amy taught us in Park Rights. Oh, thanks, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know what that is, you should uh, apply to take the Summer Writing Across the Curriculum workshop. Oh, I like it. She's not going to tell us. <laughs> so, you know, I was like, I don't know Dear Reader. This is great. When the call for applications come out, sign up and you can come spend a week with me and I'll teach you that. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Teaser. <laughs> <laughs> yes, totally. Um, Multi-level marketing thing. You it show is, right? <laughs> and then I <laughs> drag <laughs> you into others. <laughs> yes, because that's my job. Nice job. I'm selling protein powder or something. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, um, that's what we have for today's workshop. And we want to share with you that um, we have two more workshops coming up um, where we'll be talking about uh, looking at prompts. And for this one, we're going to ask you to bring in a writing prompt that you would use in one of your courses. So bring in something that you have um, that you're currently using and we'll uh, workshop through that. And then our last one um, is gonna be in April and that one will focus more on feedback and how to give um, really good feedback that will hopefully promote changes. Um, so that is all that we have. Yep, and I'll just say, um, Jamie Ells, who is the wonderful person supporting us from FCI said, if you just give her what, 10, 15 minutes? She'll have a survey about this workshop up on the um, FCI website that you can take and um, fill out and tell us how you did. And um, you might also, is there a, Jamie, is there like a comment box on that they can leave um, you know, like non-numerical feedback? All of it's gonna be non-numerical. Like comment stuff. So if also there's things that you would like Park Rights to address in terms of teaching writing, um, you know, you might leave us some comments too because I use those to develop the workshops um, that we do throughout the year and Park Rights does, I don't know, between four to six um, per year. So if there's a topic about the teaching of writing across the disciplines that you would like a targeted workshop on, we, de we definitely can develop those. So you can drop those in and Jamie can share them with me. It's going to be on the deep dive section of the FCI website. Okay. It'll be on the deep dive section of the FCI website, which again is innovatepark.org. Um, you also can feel free if you have questions about writing across the curriculum or teaching writing to international students to contact me or Zephra or Amy. Um, I think we're all pretty willing to yeah. hang out and have coffee or do a Zoom chat with you um, if there's particular issues or student issues you want to discuss. I know that I've gotten a lot personally out of sitting down with Zephyr to talk about particular students. I was struggling with things in their writing and I've learned a lot by doing that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, don't hesitate to contact us. And I hope you will join us for the next workshop and bring a, a writing assignment with you and we will workshop it. So it'll be very hands-on next time. <clears throat> Thanks very much for joining us. If you're local, join us in person for snacks next time. You're missing all the good snacks. Amy. Thanks. Good afternoon. Amy.
yes. before you go. Um, yeah. Do you see a lot of distance students using the writing um, lab, the writing resources? That really, that's so probably can answer, answer that better than I can. Yeah. Um, so the way that they would use them would either be doing a, um, a online video conference, and several of our tutors do that. Um, I'm not one of them, but actually I, I, I do sometimes Skype with my students. So we do have distance students that access it. I don't have numbers on that, but um, for example, we just, um, the Academic Support Center just went over, you know, we've got this new campus in Lenexa to talk to students there. We're really interested in making sure that the professors know and that um, the students know that as distance students, they still have access to face-to-face, -face, albeit video, tutoring with a, with a live tutor. We have several other avenues that um, your students can use. And so um, if you're, you would like us to present something for you and your students or, or for your professors, for example, making sure that everybody knows that's there, um, we'd love to increase the uptake in the distant students that are using our services. They do. But I think um, we'd like to see more of it. I, I think we would like to see more of it, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which campus are you, are you on? I'm, I'm out at Fairchild in Spokane. Okay, in Spokane. Okay, excellent. Yes, yeah. And, you know, especially if with the way it works with our tutors that do the online um, video conferencing, it's really good, for example, if we know from our campus directors or the professors that this is a class that so writing of course tutoring if you say we really need the writing tutoring we can make sure we have those online tutors available or you have a lot of esl students and you say you know zephyr we really would like you to be available for those video conferences um and just to say that that of course extends to other other tutoring subjects for um, math and science and things like that well separate from the tutoring portion the online writing lab mm -hmm. is that a different setup or is where, say that. So say the first part one more time for me. Um, for online students, they have access to PDL 200, the, the uh, online writing lab, where they can send in a product and have it reviewed and mm -hmm. given feedback on how to strengthen it. I, I'm not convinced that a lot of our distance students are actually using it because of the 72-hour turnaround. Report. Yeah. Um, you know, most of them wait till Saturday or Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Turn them in later that day. So, you mm -hmm. know, I'm just wondering how can we get more usage out of that? We bring it up to all of our new students. We keep reminding our students that mm -hmm. this is a resource available to them, but I, I'm just not convinced it's being used. Yes, and I know what you mean by that the three day turnaround. We've got just one person that works that. Um, so if you feel like more students would use that service and we could speed up the time if we had more tutors on it that's one thing um so telling them about it we found that walking them through it or for example with an assignment um and some of our like english 105 professors do this with the face-to-face -face tutoring that for one assignment everyone has to do it everyone has to come into a tutor and it could be that that's a really good way to get uptake is that you have whatever your first or your second assignment that one of the steps is submitting it to the that writing lab or making an appointment with a tutor online um, and if you make it a part of the process it's been really um, interesting because students a lot of times will say like oh wow I had no idea how helpful this was or this was great I'm glad I came in and it just removes a barrier if you put that into um, into the process for them so we found that that works I don't know if that's useful for you or not but well you know I, I've taken students in to the online library and mm -hmm. had feedback like wow we didn't know how to do this before something simple like a boolean search and until they're introduced to it it's like what's that? And it's a foreign word to them. And, and so then they don't touch it. And then their resources yeah. are limited. And it's, you know, let's see if I can sneak in Wikipedia here. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we, you know, at the Academic Support Center, we'd love to be in contact with all of our campuses and, 
and figure out how we can work more closely with you and like you said, up the students that are accessing it. So um, if we can initiate that, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Great, thanks. Does anybody else have any final questions? Otherwise we're gonna sign up, sign off for the afternoon. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for attending. Have a nice afternoon.